part, chapter, whatever, uh, today. Uh, we have three lecture meetings left, and we're going to um, kind of cover both this chapter and the chapter on the neurological exam, which is the neurology aspect of things. Um, and the two really go together quite well. Um, the neurological exam chapter is sort of showing you how the nervous system works, uh, especially some of the harder things to understand, like higher functions and uh, integrating a lot of different things together. So um, uh, that's what we'll be doing over the next uh, three class meetings. Yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, we'll do that. Some of the things that I would cover um, in this lecture material I actually covered already um, in lab. Uh, so that'll hopefully get us to move through things kind of quickly. Um, Okay, so um, the chapter I'm talking about here is the one that's anatomy of the nervous system, but also I want to consider some of the functional aspects of things. And uh, that'll touch a little bit on the next chapter, which is the somatic nervous system. Um, and I think actually yesterday I was saying uh, there was a spinal cord thing that I needed to cover, um, and that's actually uh, some stuff from the somatic nervous system chapter. And then also I want to touch on some things with the neurological exam. Um, I'll probably uh, talk about that to begin with on Thursday and then uh, include that with the stuff I do on Tuesday. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> know, that's sort of the plan I have in my head for what we're going to go through here. Um, now, I've been using this chapter already, again, for some things in uh, lab. So the first section is on the embryological perspective, and we did that, to how the primary and secondary vesicles uh, show us how the adult brain is sort of laid out, and it gives us a, a clue as to how some connections are uh, made because they don't make sense looking at the adult brain. Uh, once it's that complex. Um, and then also, uh, we've been looking at the cerebrum in, or the cerebral cortex in lab in a lot of detail. Um, so I'm not gonna do anything more about the cerebrum here, and in fact, yesterday, uh, I think I showed you the uh, Brodmann's area pictures. These ones, right? I showed you those in lab yesterday, right? Yeah, so I talked about that. Um, what I do wanna cover uh, in this section, which I'll probably do uh, <clears throat> today, is to start talking about the subcortical structures, which means things that are deep inside the cerebrum. Um, and I'll come back to this because I just want to uh, move through this area here and touch on a few other things. Um, <clears throat> so the diencephalon, as I introduced it, is uh, things that include thalamus in their name, the two main ones are the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Um, the thalamus is sometimes referred to as just a relay, uh, meaning a place where information passes through, which is not an entirely fair representation of it, but it is an important idea that um, everything that's going to go to the cerebrum has to go through the diencephalon. And in fact, the Greek word diencephalon technically means uh, something like through brain. It's the part of the brain that everything goes through. And what I'm talking about here mostly is sensory systems. With one exception, all sensory systems uh, are processed in the diencephalon, in the thalamus, before they get to uh, the cerebrum. <coughs> Um, I think I already kind of talked about this a little bit, but a good example of that is the visual system. The retina projects to the thalamus. That's where uh, your 
visual information first gets processed inside the brain. And then the thalamus connects to the cerebrum. There's not a direct connection from the retina to the cerebrum. Uh, the occipital cortex that we talked about earlier in lab that has uh, <coughs> visual function associated with it gets that visual information secondhand through the, the thalamus. And uh, again, with one exception, all of the other um, senses do that, get information through the thalamus. Um, now, the one exception that I'm mentioning here is the sense that's directly connected to this um, <coughs> cerebrum. Um, and the clue as to which one that is is simply you can look at the cranial nerves and which cranial nerve is most anterior or connected kind of directly to the cerebrum. Anybody remember? Well, if the numbering is going from anterior to posterior, then so which one's, be, sorry? Would it be 11? No, it would be the exact opposite. Well, not the exact opposite, but if it, the number is going from anterior to posterior, which one's going to be the most anterior nerve? Oh, one. One, yeah. Which is the first one? Do you remember? Or what sense is it responsible for? Both action. Right. It's a sense of smell. Okay. Um, and that's a very short nerve. It just goes through the... Uh, ethmoid bone <coughs> directly into the uh, brain above it. So it's really going into the prefrontal cortex area. It's actually not going into the prefrontal cortex, it's going into the olfactory bulb, which is uh, right on the ventral side of the frontal cortex. And the axons from the olfactory bulb go deeper into the cerebrum. And actually, uh, some of the connections from the olfactory bulb go into the hippocampus area, which is important for memory. Um, and smell is often a very potent uh, stimulus to evoke memories because of that really close connection. But everything else goes through the thalamus. Uh, vision, somatic sensation, uh, taste, hearing, balance, all of those things go through the thalamus before they get to the cerebrum for a conscious perception of those things. Now, unconscious or subconscious processing of those things uh, don't need to go through the thalamus. It's only the conscious level of things. So our sense of balance, equilibrium, is tied connect directly to parts of the brainstem and cerebellum that are necessary for maintaining our balance, but they aren't conscious perceptions. Okay. Um, but uh, any conscious perceptions that we have are going to go through the thalamus with the exception of olfaction. Now actually there are some olfactory circuits that go through the thalamus but uh, not all of them do because some are just directly wired into the cerebrum. Um, <clears throat> The brainstem, again, is made up of the midbrain pons and medulla, um, sort of in the same sense of talking about the thalamus there. Um, oh, actually, I might have said this in lab. I can't remember. Did I talk about um, in the midbrain there's an area that puts visual, auditory, and somatosensory maps together? And I usually use the example of uh, walking past trees and hearing birds chirping. Okay. Um, so there's a part of the midbrain called the superior colliculus, or I should say there's two things. Uh, the dorsal surface of the midbrain are two pairs of bumps uh, that are called colliculi, um, which translates directly to little knee. So they look like little knees, like if somebody's sitting, you can see their, the bumps of their knee. That's what it looks like to somebody. Uh, and the superior one is more uh, <coughs> uh, is closer to the diencephalon, the cerebrum, and the inferior one is closer to the rest of the brainstem. Just anterior versus posterior, kind of. The inferior colliculus is part of the auditory system, um, and then the superior colliculus is this area that processes spatial mapping. And there's several layers to this structure, and cells in one layer will 
process the location information that we get from our visual system, where things are in the visual field around us. And another layer will process the same sort of thing based on hearing, where you hear things coming from the world around you. And then another layer processes basically the map of where things are touching the surface of your body. So if you hear something down here and you feel something on your thigh, you can put those two together because these maps register. And maybe that's you know the cat that's mewing to get food and pawing at your thighs to uh, get your attention. Um, so the example I use to describe how these maps can interact. Uh, imagine if you're walking down the uh, sidewalk here in front of the buildings and pretend it's not, well, the beginning of, of winter and uh, there's leaves on the trees and birds chirping and everything. So you walk past a tree and you hear chirping above you and that when you hear that it'll correspond to the visual map and you'll be able to orient your eyes or your head to look at where that chirping is coming from. And then just to really reach and put the, the spatic sensory thing, as you're looking up, you feel something hit you right there in the head. It's a little wet and loopy. And you know that that came from the bird. So there you go. Um, that one, that's one of the important things that happens in the midbrain. Um, <clears throat> the ponds I've talked about before because the name ponds is a bridge, so it's white matter that connects the cerebellum, uh, one side of the cerebellum to the other side of the nervous system, and vice versa. Um, and then the medulla is sort of the transition into the spinal cord and um, <clears throat> contains gray matter that belongs to what's called the reticular formation, which actually extends through all these regions, um, that have very broad influence on this, uh, your nervous system. Uh, there are parts of the reticular formation that are important for regulating uh, wakefulness and sleep and those sorts of things. Um, now, what I'm not saying about things going on in the brainstem are the specific things that the cranial nerves are responsible for. So in the midbrain, you have nuclei that are important for controlling uh, moving your eyes. Uh, in the pons, uh, you have one of the nuclei of the trigeminal system that's processing uh, sensory sensations from your face. Uh, the trigeminal system also has midbrain and medulla nuclei. And then in the medulla, you have uh, a little bit more of eye movement control. Um, you have muscular control of your facial expressions, um, hearing and balance information being processed. Um, several things that are related to vital functions like <clears throat> heartbeat and blood pressure and respiratory rate and all those sorts of things uh, that are tied to the vagus nerve and autonomic function. And then also motor control of your head and neck muscles and throat muscles for swallowing and speaking. And what I just ran through there basically is going, you know, uh, <clears throat> cranial nerves three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So, uh, sorry, ten, eleven, and twelve. Uh, and so they just correspond to different regions where they're connected. And so those functions have to be related to those parts of the brain also, which isn't really laid out here so much as it's part of what comes from the cranial nerves stuff. Um, the cerebellum, uh, when we get to talking about the neurological exam, I'll talk about the cerebellum quite a bit because there's a very good set <clears throat> of uh, tests that can be run to demonstrate cerebellar function. So I'll talk about that there. But uh, just as a little preview, it's very important for coordinated movements. Um, it helps to compare your intentions that are coming from their cerebrum from the feedback coming from your body. And if what you mean to do doesn't correspond to what your body's actually doing, the cerebellum can help coordinate those movements and uh, make everything work more appropriately. Um, and we'll, again, there's some great neurological exam examples for that, which we'll come back to later on. Um, the spinal cord I'm going to talk about 
either on Thursday or next Tuesday. Um, beyond what I've already talked about, which I did mention the uh, gray matter structures because we were talking about the ventral horn when we we're looking at the motor neurons and that sort of thing. But I'll come back to that um, later on. Uh, the gray horns, which is a little bit redundant, is the gray matter in the spinal cord. And then the columns uh, are how the white matter is arranged. And again, we'll come back to that uh, later on because I want to talk about some specific things with the uh, spinal cord. Um, so that's the end of that section. That, uh, what am I trying to say? Yeah, the, that section on the central nervous system. And uh, I'll come back to, or no, I, I want to come back to now the subcortical stuff. Um, and um, subcortical means below the cortex. So as we're looking at the cerebrum, we usually think of the cerebrum as, or at this point, I should say, we, all we've looked at for the cerebrum is the uh, cerebral cortex. The area is like the primary motor cortex or the post-central gyrus or Wernicke's area, those sorts of things. Those are just regions in the cortex that's on the outside of the surface. Um, looking at this frontal or coronal section of the brain, we can actually see uh, the gray matter that is the cerebral cortex uh, extends into the lateral sulcus and so there's almost like another lobe deep inside there. Um, this area here is called the insula. It's the insulated part of the cortex. It's covered up by other things, but it's in the lateral sulcus. Um, one of the things that's found in there, one of the areas that uh, was identified is responsible for processing our conscious perception of taste information. Um, so we usually, I think of the insula we associate with taste. That's not all it does, but that's sort of the most uh, common example of what goes on there. Now, if we look deep underneath the cerebral cortex, the first thing we'll run into is white matter. There's a lot of deep white matter in there. And those rep that represents the myelinated axons that are coming from neurons in the cortex and going other places. A lot of those axons are going to cross over midline through the corpus callosum and connect to structures on the other side. And so when we met the guy Joe in that video, he'd had his corpus callosum cut because uh, to limit the spread of epileptic seizures. And so one hemisphere could communicate the other hemisphere because the uh, connections were just completely severed. Um, there are also regions in the white matter that extend down and connect to the brain stem and the spinal cord. Um, we can see a, I want to make this picture a little bit bigger. Um, we can see an area um, right here where white matter from the cerebral cortex goes down and it's headed towards the brain stem and spinal cord there. Um, and the way that it's drawn, you can uh, not on the, the screen project that you look at your computer screen. You can see that there's a hint of lines suggesting fibers running down through that area. Um, so there's a lot of white matter deep in the cerebrum that are connections mostly from the cerebral cortex to other places. Um, but what I want to talk about here is uh, a set of nuclei that are subcortical, that are deep to the cortex, um, that are part of a bigger group called the um, basal nuclei. Um, and uh, I want to talk about the basal nuclei because it's a good example of how complex the nervous system, central nervous system, can get in processing information, which means it's potentially confusing. Um, and I understand that. But I want to um, illustrate how this works so that uh, <clears throat> you can get a sense of what the nervous system is capable of. 
pass. So um, I'm going to, uh, for the sake of the recording, <clears throat> put some notes on this notepad function here um, <clears throat> instead of writing them on the board here. So I'll go back and forth between the pictures and this as I talk about it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these are called the basal nuclei. Uh, it's also referred to sometimes as the basal ganglia. Um, this is a very uh, old name for these structures, and the name kind of predates the convention of using nuclei for things inside the central nervous system and ganglia for things outside the nervous system. Uh, yeah, sorry, outside the central nervous system. Um, but uh, especially in sort of the textbook presentation of this kind of material, uh, it's tending to be called the basal nuclei to represent that it is a central nervous system structure. Uh, the basal part is sort of referring to the fact that they're at the base of the cerebrum. And... Uh, there are rather large structures that have to do with this. Um, in this cross-section we're looking at here, and in the inset you can kind of see where that cross-section is coming from, um, we're cutting through three different regions of gray matter that are part of this. There's the caudate nucleus, which is just adjacent to the lateral ventricle, and the putamen, which is a nucleus that's on the other side of this white matter bundle that goes between them. Those two are actually one functional structure called the striatum. And I pointed out the white matter that separates the two because uh, originally it was one nucleus and functionally they, it's, they still behave as a single nucleus. But um, this big bundle of white matter grew through the nucleus and separated it physically into two structures. So anatomists looking at the brain and naming things based on where they see white matter, where they see gray matter, gave these two structures separate names. But functionally, we actually know that they work as one thing, which we call the striatum. So um, the first part is the striatum. Sorry, I should do it this way. Um, which is the caudate and putamen. And then the next thing that we see in the picture, this lighter blue colored thing here is the globus pallidus. Now at this very anterior section, so we're cutting through uh, very close to the front of the brain, we only see one thing that is a globus pallidus, but there's actually two pieces to it. Um, so there's a globus pallidus, which has two parts. There's the uh, external segment, which is referred to as GP lowercase e for globus pallidus external segment. And as I'm too lazy to type it all in again, there's an internal segment, which is GPI for globus pallidus internal segment. Um, now, in this picture in the book, we don't see that. So I'm going to show you a different picture. Um, that I have in Prezi. Um, oh, shoot. There So uh, this is a presentation on this chapter and a couple of other things, which I will get to making recordings of eventually. Um, I'm still in the middle of uh, doing the nervous tissue chapter. Um, I'm almost halfway through that. Uh, I was redoing a bunch of pictures of uh, channels from that chapter, so um, that slowed me down a little bit. And uh, I'm almost ready to start paying the, the nursery, so there. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this picture is a photograph of an actual human brain. Um, and it is roughly the same location as the picture from the book I was just showing you. 
So we see the caudate nucleus here, and we see the putamen here, and the white matter that splits between the two of them. Now, notice there's this very thin little wisp of gray matter that's sort of connecting the two together. Or on the other side, there's one here and maybe a hint of another one there. They are actually connected to each other by these little bridges that look very insignificant because of this big white matter bundle that's pushing right through them. Um, and then there's a thin sliver of lighter tissue here between the putamen and the globus pallidus. Now, this particular section through the brain happens to be right at the level of this thick bundle of white matter called the anterior commissure, which is the thing that kind of looks like a mustache across the center of the picture. These are fibers going from one uh, temporal lobe to the other temporal lobe. It's kind of like uh, the corpus callosum for the temporal lobes. Um, it's a very small bundle of fibers. It's not nearly as extensive as the actual corpus callosum, but uh, it is the thing that connects th those two areas together. And it just happens to be in this picture. Um, and so it looks like it's cutting through or laying across the globus pallidus there. And that's just a little quirk about where this exact picture came from. But it's essentially the same picture uh, as the one in the book that I was just showing you. Okay. Caudate and putamen separated by a big bundle of white matter and then the globus pallidus in front of it. Um, and at this level, the globus pallidus is um, really kind of one thing. It looks like there's two here, but that's just because this anterior commissure happens to be right in the middle of our picture. Um, then, this is another slice through the brain, and this has been taken a little bit further back. So uh, I didn't show you on the inset in the previous one, but the that where I have the um, uh, cursor right there, right now it's a um, zoom tool that keeps going back and forth. Um, that's where the anterior commissure is actually located. So that's what we cut through a second ago. Now we're cutting through uh, a region a little bit further back, and obviously we're getting the brainstem in this too. Okay. The caudate is still up here, the putamen is here, and then we can see the globus pallidus actually separated into its two segments. The external segment is the one that's just next to the putamen, and then the internal segment is the more medial of the two. Um, now, at this level, we can also see uh, this structure here is the thalamus. The thalamus is made up of a number of little nuclei. So if you look closely, you can kind of see, you know, that's probably a nucleus, that's a nucleus, that's a nucleus, that's a nucleus. There are a few scattered around. Um, but that's where the thalamus is located. And then uh, below the thalamus, at this level, we have what's called the subthalamic nucleus. Now, you've heard hypothalamus. That's below the thalamus also, but it's also a bit anterior to the thalamus. Um, and actually was in the previous picture. Um, but there's another part of the thalamus called the subthalamus or subthalamic nucleus, which I'm pretty sure is this piece of gray matter right here. And I say I'm pretty sure because it's actually been a while since I've looked at the uh, atlas that this picture came from to make sure that I'm pointing at the correct thing. But for our purposes, we'll call that the subthalamic nucleus. It's fine. The anatomy, if I'm a little off, is not terribly important to what we're talking about. It's more about the function that we care about. Um, so uh, um, that gives us another portion, which is the subthalamic nucleus. And that's abbreviated STN. I'm introducing abbreviations here, again, because it makes spelling things a lot easier. And two, because I'm going to show you a picture of how everything's connected together and everything will be abbreviated. So you need to know what those abbreviations are. Um, whoops. Then um, I point out the what I believe is a subthalamic nucleus here. 
Um, <clears throat> just below that, there's this rather dark black streak here and a few dark spots here and there around it. Um, that's an area that is in fact black. It's not gray matter. I mean, it is gray matter, but uh, we see it as black because it happens to have a chemical in it that when it's exposed to oxygen, the chemical becomes a black pigment. Um, and because of that, people sectioning through brains and finding this thing that turned black when it was exposed to the air, they call that area the substantia nigra, which literally means black substance because it has this black pigment in it. And that black pigment is closely related to the pigment that we find in the skin, melanin. Um, not exactly the same molecule, but uh, closely related to it. And we see that there. Now we cannot really see in this figure that there's two parts to the substantia nigra. Um, so trust me on that, there are. We just can't quite make it out. It might be this little blob right here is one part and this big blob here is another part or something. I'm really not clear on where the, the different parts are, but there are two parts to the substantia nigra. And so let me go back here and introduce the substantia nigra to the list. And it has two parts, which are called the pars compacta, which is abbreviated SN in capital letters for substantia nigra, lowercase c for pars compacta. And the pars reticulata, which is capital S, capital N, lowercase r, that. So pars is a, sort of a Latinized version of the word part. So there's the compact part and the reticulated part, just describing those particular regions, the nucleus. Um, but those are the names that come from. So we're looking at here basically four, I mean, sorry, six parts of the basal nuclei. There's the striatum, which we will not bother uh, abbreviating, although STR sometimes is used as an abbreviation for that. Um, and then the external segment of the globus pallidus, GPE, the internal segment of the globus pallidus, GPI, the subthalamic nucleus, STN, the pars compacta of the substantia nigra, SNC, and the pars reticulata of the substantia nigra, SNR. Those six parts there. Um, and I wanted to introduce the names of these things uh, with their abbreviations because I'm going to show you a uh, wiring diagram, so to speak, of uh, the basal nuclei, and it uses the abbreviations instead of writing out all the names of things. So um, that wiring diagram is in the book uh, immediately after the picture that I started introducing all this stuff with. Here it is right here. Um, this is a figure that's actually based on an original uh, paper describing how this part of the brain works. And um, <clears throat> so it shows the striatum, GPI and SNR, SNC, STN, GPE, all that stuff's in here. Um, but it's showing you how they're connected together. Now I'm actually going to get away from this picture and use the picture in the presentation because uh, it's the same picture. Actually, the picture that's in the book, I just sent a copy of what I'm about to show to the art department and they recreated it for the book. Um, oh, and uh, what I'm showing you here is actually a screen capture of um, a PowerPoint slide. Um, I used to do my presentations in PowerPoint, so I drew all this in PowerPoint um, and I just uh, got a screen capture of it and used that here. Um, so the lines in the background are just part of the uh, the pattern that was the background in the PowerPoint uh, thing, which I'm sorry if you find that annoying, uh, but that's the way it worked out. So I just sent this on to the art department and they recreated it and it's the picture of the book. So the basal nuclei, again, are these structures right here. The list I showed you a little bit ago, the striatum, the globus pallidus external and internal segments, the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra, pars reticulata and pars compacta. Um, and like I said, this picture is based on 
uh, a drawing that was part of a research paper that was published, I think, back in the 80s or, yeah, it must have been the 80s, um, describing how this uh, region of the brain works. Now, you'll notice that there's a box over here on this side that says SNR GPI, and there's a box over on this side that says SNR GPI. Those are the same thing. It's just shown in the picture here two places for a reason, which I'll get to explain in a little bit. Um, but keep in mind that these two boxes are really two representations of the exact same thing. Now, um, the striatum, the caudate and putamen, is the receiving or entry point for the basal nuclei. Information is sent to it from the cortex, and it could be any cortex, but the examples I'm going to use are all based on motor function. So uh, these are going to be parts of the more posterior frontal lobe, which are the planning areas and the execution areas, or the primary motor cortex areas of the frontal lobe. They send information to the striatum, uh, and the striatum processes it and sends a signal back to influence whether or not a planned movement is executed. Um, so I'll describe what happens as things go through the basal nuclei in a little bit. But the output of the basal nuclei, which comes from SNR GPI, again, duplicated in this picture, but it's really one common uh, source, goes to the thalamus. And then the thalamus sends information back to the cortex. Now, the cortex and the thalamus are not part of the basal nuclei. They are the uh, <clears throat> um, parts of your somatic nervous system that are controlling planning and execution of movements, and they use the basal nuclei as a higher processing center to help figure out what's going on. So, um, in the um, key over here, there are three neurotransmitters listed here, and their colors correspond to arrows. Um, the arrows that are blue represent axons from one part of the system to another that are releasing GABA on their targets. The red ones, which actually look kind of more orange at this point, but the glutamate color and the... Those really do look orange, don't they? I don't know why they change color, but... Uh, those are glutamate uh, projections. So the input from the cortex releases glutamate. There's one little spot here in the middle of things that has glutamate. And then the thalamus sends uh, information back to the cortex, which is glutamate. Now the point of talking about GABA and glutamate is GABA is always going to inhib be inhibitory. Glutamate's always going to be excitatory. So the cortex activates the striatum, and the striatum responds by inhibiting one of its two targets. And then at the end, the thalamus is uh, inhibited by the output of the basal nuclei. What we're going to see is the basal nuclei essentially um, modulate how much they inhibit thalamus. The more they inhibit thalamus, the less the thalamus sends a signal back to cortex. So the basal nuclei can basically either inhibit or activate the thalamus and therefore uh, send signals back to cause the cortex to be more active or less active. And since we're talking about motor function, it's sort of the basal nuclei will either increase or decrease the likelihood of producing movement. Um, the other thing in here, dopamine and green, um, I want to point out at this point, because I'm talking about the key, but we'll talk about what dopamine does a little while later. Um, now, to understand what the basal nuclei do, actually, I think it's fairly simple to just break it down into the two sides of this picture. So the two blue arrows that go from the striatum to the thalamus on one side, or the several arrows that go from the striatum to the thalamus on the other side. Those two pathways are um, referred to as the direct pathway 
and the indirect pathway. And how they function in the uh, striatum tells us a lot about what the striatum does. Now, as I put these here, and I'm sort of building, you know, uh, an explanation of things as I'm writing up on a board, I put four spaces underneath the direct pathway and underneath the indirect pathway because I'm going to write things in there. Okay, um, I think it's four things. If I'm mistaken, I might add a fifth or I might take away one and it's only three. But I think it was four things I need to write in there. Um, now, the direct pathway is the striatum directly to SNR GPI. Okay. Now, SNR and GPI are two separate nuclei, but they behave as a single nucleus. Okay. Um, so we'll just link them together. Um, and SNR GPI is the output to the thalamus. Okay. Now, the indirect pathway is indirect because it's the striatum to uh, GPE to STN to SNR GPI. Okay. So it's indirect from the striatum to SNR GPI. Now, really, when we're talking about this figure, again, the box that says SNR GPI is really a single thing. Another way I could have drawn this is to just have um, the GPA STN thing off to the side, looping around, being a more indirect connection. I didn't do that again. I based this on the original artwork that was developed for a research paper. Um, and I did it this way because I wanted you to see that they're two separate pathways. They have a common ending, but they behave very differently. And in the middle here, SNC uh, breaks them apart, and there's a good reason for doing that. Okay. Um, now, in the direct pathway, we see a blue line from striatum to, or blue arrow from striatum to SNR GPI, and a blue arrow from SNR GPI to that which means that both of these connections release GABA. They both inhibit their targets. <clears throat> when you have a uh, disynaptic circuit, meaning two neurons, one neuron synapsing on another neuron, which then synapses on the target, a disynaptic circuit, um, and they're both inhibitory. That's what we call disinhibition. Okay. So if SNR GPI is active, it inhibits thalamus. But the striatum can inhibit SNR GPI, so it's no longer active and it no longer inhibits the thalamus. So disinhibition is a way to indirectly activate a target. And uh, that's what we have going on here. It's sort of like a double negative. In grammar, you wouldn't say, I don't not want to do that. But that's exactly what it's doing. It's inhi inhibiting the thing that inhibits the thalamus, so the thalamus does something. So that's disinhibition. And so the direct pathway causes disinhibition of thalamus. thalamus. And when thalamus is more active because it's no longer being inhibited by SNR GPI, this will cause more cortical activity and therefore uh, make movement more likely. A good way to keep in mind what's happening here is the direct pathway starts with a D, and disinhibition starts with a D. Okay. So keep those in mind. The direct pathway disinhibits thalamus. So if you're disinhibiting something, you're making it more active. Then the indirect pathway, if we go to that, uh, I'm not going to quite break down all the different things that's happening in the pathway, but um, 
through an inhibitory and then disinhibitory and then excitatory activity. What ends up happening is SNRGPI is more likely to be active and therefore more likely to inhibit the balance. So the indirect pathway through a few intermediate steps is going to inhibit the thalamus. <clears throat> and we'll look at how the circuit changes in a little bit, which might illustrate this a little bit better. But just to describe things here, okay. um, sort of like I wrote up at the top, I can say that the indirect pathway causes inhibition of thalamus, which is going to cause less cortical activity and make move, movement less likely to occur. Okay. That's essentially what the basal nuclei are doing. Uh, again, the D in direct pathway corresponds with the D in disinhibition. The I in indirect pathway uh, corresponds to the I in inhibition. Now, what I did in typing this stuff out, I really tried not to use I or D words elsewhere. Okay? So that you can keep the direct and disinhibition and indirect and inhibition, inhibition together. Um, <clears throat> I could have used increase or decrease movement or something like that, but if I did it, the D's and the I's would have been backwards. So I use uh, causes less cortical activity, makes movement less likely, or causes more cortical activity, makes movement less, more likely, uh, just to keep from uh, confusing the D's and the I's here. The only D's we have are direct disinhibition, indirect inhibition. Now, uh, there's a very easy way to explain what's going on here. The cortex is planning a movement. It sends the information through this um, basal nuclei, and the basal nuclei respond by either causing an increase in the likelihood of movement, I shouldn't say increase, causing movement to be more likely or to cause movement to be less likely. Um, and it comes down to there has to be a switch in the basal nuclei that switches between the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. And that switch is the part that I haven't shown yet. The substantia nigra part is compact in the middle, which releases dopamine. So the green arrow coming out of that box going up to the striatum just represents um, dopamine being released on the striatum. And the entire striatum, this whole box up here is a rather hard reach. Um, and depending on the cells that are getting the dopamine, sorry, depending on when the cells get the dopamine, they either will cause the direct pathway or the indirect pathway to be active. Now, the axons that are represented in the arrow that goes through the direct pathway to SNRGPI are coming from different cells in the striatum than the axons that go to GPE in the indirect pathway. So, the switch is really just a matter of do we activate the cells that go direct pathway or do we activate the cells that go indirect pathway? And there's a very easy way to switch between two populations of cells, just have different receptors on them. Now, dopamine being the neurotransmitter here, is a, it's important to think about that because remember, dopamine had two types of receptors the D1 receptors and the D2 receptors. D1 receptors cause depolarization and D1 receptors cause hyperpolarization. So D2 receptors are excitatory, sorry, D1 receptors are excitatory, D2 receptors are inhibitory. <clears throat> and since I talked about uh, neurotransmitters for all four of my P1 classes recently, I'm pretty sure I remember that correctly. But it says it in the book, if I got it backwards, whatever the book says is correct. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, releasing dopamine into the striatum will activate one pathway and inhibit the other pathway. Um, and I just pointed at the screen to point which one way or the other. And I'm not willing to commit verbally to which one I just pointed at because I might have been. Um, but we're going to look at some examples in a second that will clarify it all. Perfect. Um, now, that might lead you to the question, and hopefully it does lead you to the question of 
how does the dopamine thing know when to do its job? Okay. And it certainly would be possible to say, okay, the striatum indirect versus direct pathway is dependent on dopamine. And the dopamine is dependent on this, and that's dependent on the other thing, and the other thing is dependent on that thing. And we can probably sort of walk our way back through things a bit to try to find an ultimate cause. There's two problems with that. One, we don't care that much about the ultimate cause. And two, it gets murkier and murkier the further back we go into this. So what I'm going to say, of what tells SN SNC what to do, is uh, it's a matter of a state change in your brain. Um, dopamine projections in the brain are very extensive. They connect all over the brain. And when your dopamine neurons are active and they're releasing dopamine, that's sort of one state that you're in. And when the dopamine neurons are inactive and they're not releasing dopamine, that's another state. Now, it is not about sleep and wakefulness, but that's the easiest example of a state change. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when your brain is active in a certain way, you're awake. When your brain is active in a different way, you're asleep. Okay. Um, that has nothing to do with dopamine, but I'm just suggesting a state change. Um, now, I can illustrate the state change for this pretty easily because we have a perfect example right here in this room, which is us. You are all sitting in your seats and not moving a whole lot. I am, for the most part, up and moving around quite a bit. That's the state change I'm talking about. Call it calm versus active, or we'll stick with this. So, in my brain right now, um, I'm releasing dopamine into my striatum, and so when the cortex asks the basal nuclei if it's a good idea to make movement, I'm going to be in the direct pathway activity, which will disinhibit thalamus so the thalamus is more active and it tells the cortex, yeah, go ahead and make that movement. And I'm trying to move around a little bit, trying to be kind of active so that you're paying attention to what's going on up front in the room. Whereas you currently, uh, are not releasing a lot of dopamine into the striatum. Okay. Without the dopamine, the direct pathway is not turned on, and so the, the indirect pathway is sort of the default. So your brain right now is saying, I'd really like to get up and run screening out of this room, but the dopamine levels are low in these systems for you, so you're not going to succumb to that need. Okay. And you're like, I only got to make it through 20 more minutes today and then two more classes and it's all over. So your stridum is fine not being that active. The cortex sends a signal saying, should I get up running and screaming out of this room? And the indirect pathway is active. The thalamus is inhibited and the feedback from the basal nuclei is, no, don't go. Anywhere. That's essentially what's going on. That's a state change. It's a matter of being active or inactive or calm or animated like that. And that's really what the dopamine is doing. It's a switch between the indirect, I mean, direct pathway and indirect pathway. Now, um, a good way to understand how these things work is to look at two uh, disease states, which are the extremes of what's going on in the basal nuclei. The first disease, uh, shoot. Okay, that's a picture from the book. The first disease state is Parkinson's. Now, in Parkinson's disease, what's happened is the neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta have died off. Um, before somebody starts exhibiting Parkinson's disease um, symptoms, they will probably have lost about 80 to 90 percent of the cells in there. Okay. So it's a neurodegenerative disorder, and you have to be quite advanced. You have to have lost most of that, those cells to even start to see symptoms. Um, but then once symptoms start uh, setting in, it's really because there's a lack of dopamine to the striatum. Um, why does this look funny? Okay, I might have gotten the D1 and D2 receptors backward, but 
and I do that kind of often when I'm talking about this. Uh, as an aside, all of this is explained in the book. Okay, it's confusing, so I wanted to do it in class too, but I'm just confused a little bit more. But I know for a fact that in the book it's explained correctly because I went through it over and over again to be sure that I get it. So, um, lack of dopamine to the striatum will mean that the striatum will. Oh, no, no, I didn't get the D1. Uh, or maybe it is. Let's not do that. Um, the striatum will inhibit SNRGPI, which will disinhibit the thalamus, and then there will be a very strong signal coming back from the thalamus. Now, one of the main symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease is a tremor. It's called an intentional tremor, actually. Um, so when it's very advanced, you'll see people kind of shaking like this. Because it, as it starts to set in, what will actually tend to happen is somebody will get a more pronounced tremor when they're trying to move to do something. So if I wanted to pick up this remote here, and I had an intentional tremor, as I reached out, my hand would start shaking more and more. Because the intentional movement is what's coming in through the cortex. And so that's going to sort of ramp up the direct out pathway access, because there is technically a little bit of dopamine being released here. Maybe 10% of the cells are still active. So it'll switch things over a little bit uh, to this side. And the thalamus will be even more disinhibited, disinhibited, and the cortex will get a very strong signal to move, and it just causes tremors sort of on top of the movement it's trying to make. When the SNC is completely gone and there's no dopamine, then it's not really intentional tremors, it's just constant tremors. Um, and so Parkinson's disease is sort of like the direct pathways being locked in place. Okay, that switch can't go one way or the other. It's always in the direct pathway um, system, and uh, the thalamus is continuously disinhibited and the cortex is getting overstimulated and you uh, <clears throat> you will just be at basal resting levels more active than normal. The other side of this is the condition called Huntington's disease where in this case the neurons in the striatum die off. This is another neurodegenerative disease and so these uh, neurons die off and cause problems. So now there's no input from the striatum to either of the pathways, which is going to end up uh, keeping the striatum from inhibiting SNRGPI. So SNRGPI will activate, uh, will inhibit the balance. So uh, with the striatum lost, it's sort of like the indirect pathways locked in place, and you get very little, if any, activity from the balance back of the cortex. Now. While tremors, especially intentional tremors, tremors are a common uh, symptom of Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease has moved, is a movement disorder too, but it presents with what are called ballistic movements, which is uh, sort of overcompensating and making bigger movements than are necessary. Uh, so while I suggest if I want to reach for this um, uh, remote with Parkinson's disease, you might see a more pronounced tremor as I'm going for that as the direct pathway is more active than Parkinson's. But when the indirect pathway is more active, your brain's sort of getting the signal, don't move as much. But if you have to move, you've got to kind of ramp up the signal and overcome what the basal nuclei are doing. And so a ballistic movement will be where you go and you really go for whatever movement. Okay. So uh, you might kind of overshoot the movement, but you're going to try to overcome the indirect pathway. Huntington's disease used to be called Huntington's chorea. Chorea, spelled with a C-H, not a K. I'm referring to the uh, peninsula in Asia. But rather, um, it's the Greek root of the word choreography, and it means dance. And people with Huntington's disease were thought to be possessed with um, <clears throat> demons or whatever that made them dance, and so it was called Huntington's Korea. Uh, it's not referred to that too often nowadays, but Korea is the name for this uh, kind of symptom where you kind of move too much to overcome what's happening.
Um, so these two conditions kind of show uh, the difference between the indirect pathway being locked in place, like you'd see with Huntington's disease, or the direct path being locked in place, as you'd see with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and it's really a matter of where the certain cells are dying off in those two diseases. Um, now, Parkinson's disease uh, has come a bit more into public awareness, awareness, because there are a couple of celebrities that have been affected by it in uh, recent years. Um, and they've done a good job of raising awareness about Parkinson's. So probably the one that most people are familiar with is um, Michael J. Fox. Okay. Uh, Michael J. Fox, when he was younger and he was on Family Ties, if you even ever heard that television show, um, things were fine, he had no symptoms. He went on to do the Black Back to the Future trilogy, things were fine, but then sometime in his 30s, which would be about when he wrapped up the Back to the Future trilogy filming, he started developing these uh, symptoms. Um, after Back to the Future, which made him kind of a big star, one of the big projects he did, which was not immediately after Back to the Future, but several years later, he was on a show called uh, Spin City, which was, he was something in New York City's uh, city government, and so he's sort of in charge. And you could see, if you watch that show over the couple of few seasons that he was on it, um, how his behavior changed. Um, if you think about him now, you probably think of him as a fairly physical actor, and he kind of was his whole career, but it's really more pronounced because he's, uh, being an actor, being a very physical actor, he's able to control the symptoms he gets from Parkinson's disease and able to kind of uh, compensate for that. So if you go back and you watch some of that stuff from Spin City where he didn't seem to have any symptoms, you can really see where he's trying to uh, mask them by making his body behave differently. Um, nowadays, he's commonly uh, seen on The Good Wife, and he plays a character that has a movement disorder, so he just works his symptoms into that. Um, and the character doesn't have Parkinson's disease, has a different um, dyskinesia, which is the name for a movement disorder. Um, I can't remember offhand what it is, but he's, he, again, incorporates it into how he acts. He did a very short-lived um, sitcom on NBC, because that's where he started out, um, where he played basically himself, and it was sort of about how his family dealt with him being this famous person with Parkinson's disease, uh, but apparently got really tired out from that. Um, and then after that, I think he had um, a brain stimulation intervention, which is something that's becoming more common for Parkinson's disease. Um, <clears throat> I have a big X over SNC here as it is completely gone, but it can still be there and still be making a little bit of uh, dopamine. And a lot of interventions for Parkinson's disease are about making what's left of this nucleus be able to do its job. I think uh, brain stimulation might actually get in and sort of uh, ramp up the activation there of that nucleus or something like that. I'm not entirely sure how that works, but I believe. He had that done, and he's been feeling better, and he's been going back to acting, and he's been on the good way for uh, several seasons. But um, the other person that I uh, I alluded to that has Parkinson's disease, um, not quite as uh, <coughs> um, in the forefront as Michael J. Fox, because Michael J. Fox has uh, had some, I guess, luck, so to speak, in handling his disease. But the other person is Muhammad Ali. Now, Muhammad Ali doesn't actually have Parkinson's disease. He has what we would call Parkinsonism. And the difference between the two is Parkinson's disease, we don't know what causes it ultimately. Okay. So we don't know why uh, Michael J. Fox got that disease or anybody else that's diagnosed with it got that disease. If we know why somebody has what looks like Parkinson's disease, then it's officially not Parkinson's disease because we don't know what causes that. We know perfectly well what caused Muhammad Ali to develop the exact same sort of condition. And that's the fact that he's a boxer. Okay? He got hit in the head far too many times. Um, 
And one of the worst uh, professions to be in for brain injury is uh, boxing because you get hit in the head too often and cause them problems. Um, probably right after that is football. Uh, but we're only starting to learn things about the damage that people do to their brain when they play professional football. But definitely Muhammad Ali has Parkinsonism because we know exactly what caused the death of this part of his brain. It's just a very fragile nucleus, and so hitting your head over and over again is going to cause problems. Um, and I would imagine that if you went to visit a lot of retired boxers, a lot of them will have at least some tremors going on or something like that. So that's common. Um, <clears throat> so Parkinson's disease, we don't really know what causes it. Uh, there's actually something in AMP2 that I'm going to cover that will talk a little bit more about the, uh, not the cause of, but some of the things that are happening in Parkinson's. So we'll get to that in MP2. Um, now, Huntington's disease, we understand a little bit better. It's very clear what causes Huntington's disease. It's a genetic disorder. Um, and there's a lot of really good information about Huntington's disease that comes from a family that lives, I think, in it's either Colombia or Bolivia. I can't remember which one. Um, and for all I know, it's like Venezuela. I'm just completely off. But, uh, there's a Central or South American family that has a history of Huntington's disease in the family for like seven generations. And so uh, they were able to study it uh, in a lot of detail. There's a uh, mutation in the gene or a protein that these neurons make, which helps give them uh, their structure as part of their cytoskeleton. And the mutation causes that cytoskeleton protein to uh, not work properly and the cells collapse and they die off. Um, when somebody passes that gene on to the next uh, generation, the mutation gets amplified. And so over the seven generations, they saw a progression in the on age of onset, or they decreased the age of onset. So the first generation, it may have, might have happened when they were 70. And then the next generation when they were 60, and the next generation. 50, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, it's a fairly late onset condition, so oftentimes people have already had children before they even find out that they're uh, at risk for it. Um, but knowing that older people in your family have it, it's a good chance that you're a carrier. Uh, I shouldn't say a good chance, so it's a chance that you're a carrier. I don't know what the um, uh, transmission math looks like. Uh, but uh, if you are passing it on after several generations, uh, it'll end up being a fairly early onset version of the disease and cause a lot of problems. Uh, so in the seven generations of that family I mentioned, uh, now it's coming up early enough that they know it before they're even ready to have children. Um, and also it's been around for a long time, so they all are very concerned about it, so they're, they don't want to pass it on to the next generation. But that's what causes Huntington's disease, it's a specific mutation in the gene that's passed down that causes those cells to die off. So. Um, okay, so... Thursday and next Tuesday, we're going to continue on using this presentation to look at a few things, and maybe over the weekend I'll get around to swapping the pictures out more of the pictures out for what's in the book. Um, uh, a lot of these pictures are from another book, but they're equivalents in our book. Um, and uh, let's see, there's a section here on the surface anatomy of the brain, that's stuff that we did in lab. Um, this box down here is the meninges and cerebrospinal fluid, which we did yesterday in lab. Um, this is cranial nerves, which again, we did in lab. Um, here's the neurological exam. I'll use this to introduce that. Um, and then these two boxes up here are about the spinal cord material. Um, so I'll probably introduce that on Thursday. Uh, hopefully I'll remember to bring the portion model in. If not, I'll just use some pictures here. Um, and then Tuesday, uh, probably wrapping up Thursday and then going into Tuesday, uh, next week, uh, we'll look at the um, neurological exam and get an understanding of how neurology tells us a little bit about how the nervous system works. So, um, so that's all I have for today. We'll wrap it up a little bit early, and I'll see everybody on Thursday.